Well, um, thank you so much. And I want to thank Karub, um USA for putting this on um, and just inviting all the wonderful experts that they've had um, for this week. Um, you know, I'm just honored to be included in that, that group as well. So um, it's, it's a great honor to be here today. And I want to welcome everyone that's um, uh, coming into the talk. And um, I did send a PDF of my slides um, with some references and resources at the back, as well as a couple of different documents that I based a lot of my talk on. Um, so just going to pop through a few things. So um, no real financial disclosures um, to talk about um, during this activity at all. And just briefly some learning objectives there. Um, and um, I just kind of want to address something that I think is kind of um, that we need to kind of consider during all of this. But I don't know about you all. I am so thankful for Zoom and I'm so thankful for activities like this. Um, but since COVID-19 has started, I feel like I have been averaging around two and a half to three hours a day on meetings like this. Is anyone else kind of just in the comment box you can or, or through your um, you can kind of give a thumbs up. Um, I feel like I've gone from one hour a week to several hours a week. Um, and there's um, several articles, you know, just kind of out there you can find quickly with a super intense search through your Google web browser of um, COVID-19 COVID Zoom fatigue was my search <laughs> terms. Um, found this one article that they kind of talk about as well as just kind of the Zoom exhaustion. I think that we do need to address the reality that um, doing this, although it's good to help us with some of the social um, distancing and the isolation we have to kind of reconnect and to continue to do some trainings and understand what's going on to also understand that these um, are can be emotionally draining as well. Um, so I just hope that you are practicing some some wellness type things um, during this time. Um, one thing I did recommend, and I think I'm actually breaking the, the rules, is when you're in Zoom is to try to always kind of do the speaker view so that you're not seeing, you know, four or five, even I think up to 12 other screens all at once um, is one thing that can kind of help with that. And so, um, just moving on, um, I, I think there's a kind of a learning gap here that, um, you know, seeing that uh, people that are signing in, I think a lot of you will probably um, have already heard of some of the stuff I'm talking about today. I hope to touch on maybe a few things that you haven't quite thought about it in that way. Um, but I do think that we need to understand that there's um, somewhat of a, um, with everything that's going on, we're experiencing these secondary trauma type um, uh, symptoms um, with the COVID-19 um and which can lead to vicarious trauma compassion fatigue and burnout so these numbers that i'm throwing out are the current um, stats or roughly um sorry so as of 10 o'clock this morning i think is when i sent these out we had around 2 million cases worldwide of COVID 19 um and when i checked just before signing on i believe that was um approaching 2.1 million or so maybe it was 2 million 36, 50,000 or so. Um, so so um, a lot of people have been affected around this um, across the globe. The deaths at that time were 127, almost 128,000 deaths, um, which is just um, pretty astounding to think about that, that that's just been in the past, um, you know, three, three and a half months, basically since the uh, 2020. Um, here in the U.S., for my um, for those of you participating, again, this was around six o'clock. We are almost at six hundred and ten thousand cases and twenty six thousand deaths. And I did check right before coming on, and that is approaching twenty seven thousand already. Um, for my colleagues in Oklahoma, um, we have also been hit um, with this. Uh, we are a little bit more uh, rural type setting, so we don't have nearly the population density. But we are, um, are almost to 2,300 cases as of this morning, with about 120 with 123 deaths. Um, and if you do some quick math, that's pretty much a 5% uh, fatality rate um, for known cases and known deaths from this. Um, for my our colleagues that are in Israel, I did look this morning, and there's just over 12,000 cases for you all, um, and 110 deaths. And then um, I did go ahead and look because I was just kind of curious about the Gaza and the West Bank. Um, and there was 308 cases there. Um, and as of this morning, only two deaths reported um, for that area. 
Um, there is a site, I, I don't know if any of you are following it, um, through um, uh, Johns Hopkins University. They're be basically running a dashboard. Um, I will tell you about that. You can Google Johns Hopkins University and um, COVID-19 dashboard and we'll bring it up. Um, but I would caution you um, to not do what I did in the first few weeks that I found out about it and basically have it running in my browser all time um, because it can become a little stressful to constantly be um, looking at that. I tend to now just check it um, basically once a day um, just to kind of keep up to date on it. So um, I will just as a disclosure, a lot of what I'm talking about is from a text called Trauma Stewardship. Um, and I think it's something that we need to be aware of. And even if you've been trained in this to kind of uh, keep your focus on during this time, whether you are on the front line um, working in facilities that you're going to be taking care of COVID-19 patients, or if you're working with people who have been exposed to the front line and you're helping them through the process, um, but we need to understand that what we're doing through this is um, definitely affecting us. And even if you're maybe not um, actively working on any of it, um, just our community and our society as a whole, the trauma that we're all experiencing through this is something that's going to be uh, uh, not just now, it's not just an acute trauma, it's going to be kind of a chronic trauma. And um, we're going to have uh, years of um, recovering from this. So moving on to how um, this is a lot of these um, screenshots are for healthcare workers. Um, however, I will um, say that I believe that this also applies to people within uh, uh, the social work field, um, as well as um, frontline um, responders like uh, law enforcement and um, EMS. These are just a few of the headlines I grabbed, um, you know, from April 3rd, um, kind of starting to question how many workers have been affected. Um, and these, these are um, in the US. And then another one up in Detroit, just April 12th, so just this past weekend, with nearly 3,000 um, people that they were concerned about that had been affected within their healthcare system of employees. So that doesn't mean just doctors. So this would be, um, you know, uh, janitorial staff, uh, people providing food, um, and uh, front desk security, as well as medical providers, um, physicians, nurses, PAs, and pharmacists. Um, and they, the reports just kind of kept coming out this past. Sunday on 60 Minutes, uh, they basically looked at um, the healthcare workers in New York City, and basically, due to the lack of the P um, the personal protective equipment or PPE, that these workers were having um, uh, an increased risk of infection. Um, you know that you can see here in the quote that they're describing it as quote like hell on earth. Um, for them, if you've been following any social media, you'll see a lot of people kind of coming out with these pleas. Uh, there's a tribute to people and um, the National Health Service, I believe, uh, from Britain or the UK, uh, um, where they kind of went through and just talked about the, those workers who have died from COVID-19. So it's not just people being infected, but actually um, dying. And then even just this morning, um, NPR kind of released this, that they estimate at least 9,000 US healthcare workers have been sickened with this. Um, so. If I'm to be honest, my real disclosure to you all is I have not treated a COVID-19 patient yet as a um, pediatrician, um, but I am emotionally fatigued from it. Um, talking with my colleagues, I have several colleagues that I would count as friends as well who work in both ER as well as um, uh, adult medicine in the ICU and um, as anesthesiologists. And I've just listened to their stories and what they've gone through. And that's just kind of emotionally exhausting to me as I am there to kind of support them. And then kind of this feeling, if, I don't know if anyone else has felt this, but I've had a lot of um, nutrition kind of feel a little helpless right now because um, luckily for pediatrics, there's not, um, kids really don't have severe symptoms. There have been a few um, deaths reported worldwide, but they're, it's fairly rare. So most of what we're seeing in kids from a pediatrician standpoint is similar to um, what we just kind of see anyway, um, most of our winter viruses in them. It's a, a respiratory infection similar to RSV, um, but kids tend to do fairly well with it overall. Um, so we, for me, I've, I've been just fine, kind of feeling helpless as I um, think about my colleagues and friends who are exposed to this. Um, even the, the first death here in Tulsa um, was um, cared for by um, a friend of mine, and I um, ran into uh, this provider um, 
the day after the death and just kind of seeing how uh, defeated um, they were um, after kind of going through that process was just kind of um, taxing and, and draining for me. So just to kind of touch base, I wanted to go through and talk about secondary traumatic stress. Um, this is definition from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Um, so it's that duress that you, um, the results when an individual hears about firsthand trauma experiences of another person. So for some of you that may be on the front lines, you may be the one experiencing the primary trauma, and then your colleagues would be experiencing the secondary trauma by you talking about um, some of the COVID-19 patients coming in, or if you're providing services to your clients or patients that have been through this, just kind of that um, hearing about these stories and hearing about the um, people who were, you know, were somewhat sick on a Saturday, Sunday, Monday went to the hospital and um, died by Wednesday, which are some of the a lot of what we hear about some of the deaths or just for even the people who live um, the stories because this virus can uh, impact them um, health wise and they tend to be pretty sick for um, you know that seven to 14 day period um, so another definition is when you're exposed to events um, directly experienced by another and you kind of became become overwhelmed with it um, I think this is a another kind of good way to look at um, that uh, secondary traumatic stress. Um, because I am someone who loves having dogs around, I actually took my um, therapy dog in training, Alvis, home um, earlier today. I thought I would include a few from a talk that I gave a few months ago. Um, so this was provided by Dr. Curry out of um, University of Louis Louisville School of Medicine, Kentucky. It's Daisy and Roscoe, their therapy dogs for their Children's Advocacy Center. Um, so you're going to see some pictures of cute dogs through all of this. Um, so this is kind of what I wanted to frame it as, is looking at this, uh, probably um, one of my colleagues termed the, or coined the term the trifecta to talk about this. So when we have primary trauma, um, if you've experienced that, or if you're someone that's working with someone with primary trauma, you'll have a secondary trauma and that can lead to vicarious trauma and i think the key thing just to touch base with on um, vicarious trauma is this is really just transform your worldview and i i don't think that there's any doubt that um, the covid 19 pandemic has uh, changed everyone's worldview uh, this has been likened by um, even uh, the queen of england recently to um, how she was and when she was talking to her people during the, the bombings in um, london during world war ii um, and it's going to kind of transform how we look at things um, and that's vicarious trauma does that so just in general it's um, the trauma that you um, vicarious trauma is when you've um, heard a story you, from a client or you've heard a story from a patient and then your worldview changes because of that so for me someone that does a lot of child maltreatment hearing about um, families that have experienced the trauma or a child that experiences a trauma and then if I go out with my family and um, whenever we're done with social distancing and we're at the park together and I see another family and I start creating stories for what's going on with them in my head, that's vicarious trauma. I'm basically taking um, some of the trauma I've experienced by listening to um, what's happened to children and projecting it on other um, family members. Um, I have heard a lot of my colleagues in social work talk about how they um, do this, like when they're at the grocery store, they'll hear um, maybe a, a mom speaking harshly to the child in the cart and immediately start thinking um, about something with their client, um, worrying about the child being um, harmed. Um, and the vast majority of those actually are probably just fine. Um, and also within vicarious trauma, I think we need to recognize that there's institutional trauma. So my institution, the University of Oklahoma, kind of going through this, it's, everything has changed on campus or essentially on a work from, from home, remote work um, that was really kind of, you know, honestly kind of chaotically done um, where the first few weeks of social distancing, a lot of people who could have been working from home weren't. Um, and then as everything progressed, they were kind of sent home. But I, I think that you need to recognize the organizations you work in um, are not just going to pop out of this when, you know, the, uh, your governor's order, your local um, elective officials order you, that you can um, kind of re go back out into society. Um, it's going to take a, a while, um, weeks to months, if not years, for some of these organizations to kind of um, come out of this. And that's kind of their, their view of how things need to be done are going to change, which I think could be somewhat positive.
Uh, the next component that I think of in the trifecta is the compassion fatigue portion. Um, and compassion fatigue really is that um, both emotional and even physical exhaustion that you experience um, with this. And this comes from that re repeatedly caring for patients that require a high level of empathy. So hearing um, some of the stories that you will be hearing coming out of this or during this time right now um, are just going to be emotionally exhausting as you kind of go through that and process that. Um, so I have heard this also called empathy fatigue. Um, and for me, this is big because it is a contributing factor in burnout, which we really don't want um, all of y'all out there doing this great work to um, experience burnout right now. And you can actually, um, you can see physical and emotional symptoms um, within your, your staff or your child maltreatment staff or um, the other staff at your facility as well. Um, so symptoms of that. Um, you know, you can again throw up a, a thumbs up or a clap if you've experienced any of this. Um, so I, I know for me that this has been something that, you know, day in and day out kind of experiencing uh, just a little bit more irritable and maybe just a little bit more short with my staff when they're um, talking to me. Um, although my patient um, clinical level has gone down, just kind of the, um, the fatigue I have experienced with all this has, has gone up. Um, avoiding some of the meetings. So there's times, I mean, even right now, there's really no reason for, for me not to sign into any um, online Zoom meeting that I have, but I, um, have, you know, just have chosen not to do some of those. It's just kind of um, tired of uh, listening to that. Um, and then also um, just in general with um, compassion fatigue, this is where we can actually kind of try to predict what is going on with a client based off of another client or another patient. So this is where you may have heard a really bad story on you know, the second um, client you had in the day. And by the time you're on your fourth, who maybe relative to that other patient doesn't have anything in your mind kind of going on um, that's, that's that big. But to that person, that individual, there is something that's very traumatizing that's happening. But you'll kind of start predicting their story like, oh, yeah, I know where this is going there. The first thing they're going to tell me is about this. And you just kind of start creating that and you almost start directing the conversation towards that. Um, and then also just kind of avoiding some difficult topics. So I find myself doing this, um, particularly with my um, hospital consults, that I um, may not actually go into uh, the detail that I normally would whenever I'm feeling compassion fatigue and kind of setting down and going through and showing the families the x-rays and talking to them about each of the findings that we have um, because I'm just kind of uh, just kind of tired of doing that or even if you're an, an educator um, I found myself actually doing this last week when I was doing um, a, a hospital consult in the ICU and I had two residents who were there and I just to really teach them the way I normally would I was just kind of tired it was a Friday afternoon. I wanted to get home and I uh, just really didn't um, engage with them the way I normally did. So I just kind of avoided teaching at that point. Um, feeling really discouraged. Um, for, for me, I think this comes down to how we feel right now about the lack of PPE with this. Um, and for those of you who may be engaging with clients and be concerned about that, um, how to protect yourself and to protect your family um, as well. And then just at the end of the day, kind of that emotional and that fatigue and exhaustion that you can experience. Um, here we go with another transition to a dog. Um, this is Mac from Loma Linda University. Um, and there's another really cute picture of Mac, but I just couldn't quite justify fitting, you know, four or five pictures of um, all the, the same dog in. So um, anyway. Um, so moving on, finally, to kind of finish up with burnout. And um, this is where we don't want to get right now. And this is where I hope that you all, um, through practicing some mindfulness and wellness over, um, you know, it's really going to be over the next months, if not year, because um, we need you all out there doing what you're doing. Um, so to kind of avoid the burnout. So this is really where you have that full emotional exhaustion exhaustion you just really do lose um, that drive and the reason for you to be working and then we just start viewing the clients as not um, human and, and it's not as uh, in, in the same way and just kind of looking at them as the next the next thing to get through 
And um, I think that that can become really dangerous when we're as, as a helper. Um, and the impact can be as we kind of do go through this, the, that emotional exhaustion, the tiredness, you actually can have physical symptoms. So um, maybe some muscle aches, some sores, um, you really just don't have those emotional resources and everyone just feels kind of ex um, emotionally extended. As well as that depersonalization, um, you're often will talk about everything, even things you generally care about in negative or it's kind of cynic attitudes. Um, I, I am the, the master of cynicism and um, uh, cynical jokes. And I have really learned that when I am feeling burnt out or when, when I'm approaching that, that I become more cynical and I kind of make more cynical jokes and kind of uh, say things. Then that's what I have used now as my cue to kind of catch myself of um, kind of feeling that, um, that those burnout type symptoms coming on. Um, you can also have just kind of redu reduced personal accomplishment from it as well. So you may get through your day and just feel like you really didn't do anything to help anyone. Um, and you just feel a lot incompetent, you feel inefficient. Um, and overall, um, just not really feeling fulfilled at the end of the day with your work. And so um, the impact this has is um, our the exposure that we have to severe and chronic stressors will predispose us to this. Um, you can actually just start developing um, several dysfunctional things like depression, anxiety, sleep disturbances, and fatigue um, for your family and your loved ones. Um, even though you're, you're social distancing right now, um, you, you may start have seen some broken relationships. Um, people will often turn to substances during this time. Um, and having, um, you know, just relationship problems or problems with your partner. Um, and even what I'm concerned about as well is for people who may be nearing retirement now um, or, you know, may have been like, I'm just going to get through the next five years and they kind of get to this point now with the COVID-19 and just decide to retire and we lose a big part of our helper workforce, which I think is concerning. Um, I think I talked about um, that, that the uh, the risk for depression um, and uh, as well that can happen from burnout. And then the other big thing is just not being a very good provider or even in general, a good person. <laughs> so um, finding yourself not just not performing at work, but not performing um, in your personal life as well, where you're just kind of negative towards a lot of people. Um, so just as an example, this morning, um, excuse me, yesterday when I got home from work, we had a notice from the, um, a local construction company that's doing some road work on um, the street just south of our home that said your water will be turned off at 9 p.m. on the 15th, which is 9 p.m. today. And last night as we were getting ready for bed, we turned on our water and our water was off um, at 9 p.m. on the 14th. And um, I was just like, well, they messed up. They kind of um, uh, just didn't get it right. And it's supposed to come on at five, so I didn't think it was that big of a deal. But this morning as I woke up, um, at about six o'clock and the most fun part of my day is making my um, pot of coffee for myself. I went down and our water was still off. And as I waited around, it still didn't come back on. And I could feel that hostility kind of um, burning up and um, me being really upset at the person that put that on. Um, and so I eventually did call the number on there. And um, I did a little check with myself knowing that I was, had been kind of feeling some stress and everything. And as I, um, as soon as the gentleman picked up, I really just kind of changed my tone and just kind of explained, you know, what was going on and what I was concerned about. And ultimately found out that it wasn't their fault at all. The city of Tulsa had turned off our water because they were doing some work north of us and broke the water line. So um, the gentleman was really kind and reached out to them and found that out for me and, and helped me out. So just kind of by having that check, I kind of did that. Um, there are some risk factors um, as well for burnout. Um, so just the lack of a positive work environment, or I would say right now the, um, or the presence of a negative work environment. And I feel like for those of us who are um, kind of had our work changed over the past four weeks by working from home um, and, or, and or for us, we've kind of had to modify our clinic that this has really changed everything. So we've lost a lot of the pauses that we did have 
and we are dealing with a lot of more um, issues now with kind of how we're able to care for the kiddos that we want to see. Um, and those are all kind of leading to that. It's just been stressful. My colleagues, Dr. Passmore and Dr. Conway, we basically um, talk every day through either a Zoom or um, uh, FaceTime just to kind of go through all that, but we're all kind of experiencing those frustrations. And then there's some demographic factors that can lead to burnout, um, which by uh, the evidence base is the younger so, um, age, so um, newer workers in the field, there is a slight predominance of the female gender. Um, and then those who don't really have um, a social support, either um, through marital, uh, marital status or kind of that friend social support. And then for those of you who are maybe working longer hours, I don't know about you, but when you're working from home, um, as some of you may be doing right now, I kind of find myself on my admin week when I was working from home, starting like at six in the morning and sometimes not finishing till like 10 at night, which would be unusual if I was actually working from here. Um, and that kind of finishes out that trifecta with burnout there. And you can kind of see the, the Venn diagram as you kind of um, have those compassion fatigue symptoms, vicarious trauma symptoms, and those burnout symptoms. As they all kind of combine there. Um, and there's those overlaps that you have with it. So as I mentioned before, this is um, my dog, therapy dog in training. This is um, Albus the Doodle Door. And yes, it's named after the Harry Potter character, Albus. He's an eight month old, 80 pound white golden doodle um, that I bring here to the advocacy center with me most days when I'm here. Um, so how do we kind of fight this? Um, or not fight, that's probably not the right word. So how do we mitigate some of the effects of secondary traumatic stress? Um, we really do have to just kind of um, understand that we all need to have a supportive environment here. So for those of you working from home, kind of making that home environment as supportive as you can, talking to your family and those with you that when you're working, you kind of need to have that. For those of you going out into the field, um, I really hope that you're kind of focusing on your physical safety, you're taking precautions. Um, they do recommend universal masking now if you're just kind of going out. Um, I would say if you're going to clients' homes that you definitely want to maintain um, some that six foot radius and distance um, with a mask on and kind of worrying about your own physical safety as well as those of your clients um, and that you're kind of creating that type of environment. Um, doing trainings like this, so um, in general, you need to be confident in what you're doing. So understanding this disease process and how it's working and how it's impacting you and your community. Um, so doing trainings like what um, Haruv has um, put on this week of how this is impacting all of us. And then what I think is really important is focus on compassion satisfaction, which um, I probably don't do the, the best of talking more about this, but um, this is really where we kind of all refill our tanks. So when we see and work with some of those clients and we just can take out um, some of the, the good stuff that um, we get out of that and just kind of using that and focusing on that as we refill our tanks. Um, and knowing that by, by doing what we're doing right now with social um, distancing that we are kind of flattening the curve and hopefully helping um, prevent the spread of this illness and um, kind of taking some, some happiness from that at the end of the day as well. Um, so this is a pretty famous quote, actually. Um, I think it was from the, the 60s by Victor um, Frankl. And, um, so what is to give light must endure burning. And I really kind of know that we as helpers, um, in order to go out there and kind of um, spread the light and to kind of help others, that we ourselves are going to be impacted by this. And um, the key is that we don't um, burn ourselves out and that we kind of replenish ourselves. Um, so I'll just close with a few things. Um, I will. Uh, in full disclosure here, um, the Center for the Traumatic, um, for the Study of Traumatic Stress, the website, um, I believe is at the end of my references, and not just Google um, what's down there, but these are all things taken um, directly from a few handouts that I did send um, to Gal, so she can forward those on. Um, so, you know, they, this is almost verbatim from some of those things. Um, but we need to, um, this is kind of what they, they recommend in a couple of their handouts. Um, and just to understand that as you're out there, there may be kind of a surge in your care demands, wherever your area is, um, for if you're having to um, work with more of the clients and um, there may be more people um, presenting for care, um, healthcare um, personnel um, may be sick or um, need additional caring. 
there's an ongoing risk for infection. So those are some of the challenges that you have as well. Um, as I already mentioned, the uh, lack of um, PPE or proper equipment. So um, this could not just mainly mean protective equipment, but for some of us working from home or dealing with clients who are at home, they may not have access to high-speed internet or access to a computer that can um, let them zoom into meetings like this. But um, this really is intended really for the, the protective equipment to protect yourself from getting sick. Um, and this is what I hear a lot from my colleagues, particularly in the ER, um, is that they just don't have it. They're reusing masks basically for, for some time, several days. Um, they're reusing gowns. Um, they're just kind of spraying down gowns and going back in. And that just really makes them feel unsafe at the end of the day. Um, my one colleague uh, who works in the ER here in Tulsa, she actually sent her family, uh, her husband and two children away to um, St. Louis um, because she was afraid of infecting them just because of her risk. And then just for herself, she's um, um, pregnant and is expecting. And so she's just worried about the risk to um, her, her baby as well. Um, the, the lack of medical and emotional support. Um, and then just the psychological stress in the areas of outbreaks. So, you know, New York City has been kind of the epicenter for the US. Um, that's kind of leveling off, but now we're seeing um, areas like in Chicago, uh, Detroit came up in Louisiana, um, were all there as well. So what are some of the strategies for you? Um, so just really meet your own needs. Um, take care of yourself, eat well, <laughs> eat as well as you can. Um, this is kind of an opportunity to maybe start um, doing some cooking that is a little bit healthier, drink plenty of water, um, sleep regularly, um, take breaks. So frequent breaks, I, this is one thing I have been doing fairly well. Um, and it's something that actually having to take care of a therapy dog has helped me as this morning in between seeing kids, I took my, um, the dog on a little walk around our campus. Um, luckily right now in Oklahoma, um, we're having overall fairly decent spring weather and you can get out and just kind of take even a five minute stroll or walk, um, just kind of do something fun and relaxing. I would encourage you while you're doing that to try to disconnect from any electronics because we're doing so much electronically right now. So, um, you know, if you have to have your phone with you, that's fine, but not walking around looking at social media, but actually just kind of um, looking around at your um, the actual environment. Um, maintain your contact with your peers and colleagues, kind of what we're doing here. So um, again, we've been checking in frequently with just my immediate team, our department is checking in weekly. And then nationally, I'm on a couple different, um, or within the state of Oklahoma, there's three times a week call in that we can kind of get updated on it as medical providers to find out about um, places that may be popping up as far as increased risk for the COVID-19. Um, and then our the program directors are kind of checking in so that we can talk about issues with our fellows and kind of bounce ideas off. Um, constructive communication, um, I think this is key because right now I think there may be times that, that you're frustrated with because everything has changed. So for me at the advocacy center where I work, our team members, um, I asked after the second week of doing this to start doing a weekly Zoom meeting um, just to kind of talk and talk about the different barriers that we're um, now seeing um, and some different solutions and doing that. And if you have issues, don't just kind of point the blame, but maybe come up with something that may be constructive to kind of help with the team. Um, check in on your family. I, I have now um, several group texts with different uh, people. So some both friends, close friends and family where we just kind of check in on each other. And sometimes it may be just some, uh, you know, I have a friend that's a nurse and she just kind of will send out just how exhausted she is. And then, um, you know, some of the other ones will be just um, fun memes or gifts that kind of come through. And then the um, everyone in, around you has different needs, even your neighbors, immediate neighbors, your um, coworkers, and your colleagues. Um, and then last, I think, is the big one is um, stay updated. So like I was saying with the um, Johns Hopkins University um, dashboard, it's, it's good information to check. However, you really need to limit it because um, I found myself, again, during that first week, 10 days, just constantly checking things. And I could just feel that fatigue starting to build up. Um, I liken it to, for me, um, a big thing was the uh, uh, September 11th attacks um, in New York. I was a first year medical student. I basically spent the next two weeks every day just reading everything I can about it, and it was just exhausting. And so I always kind of keep that in the back of my mind when we have these kind of things come up. Um, and just to kind of go back to focus on sleep, this really should be a priority. Um, 
if you have access to when you wake up to just view some natural sunlight for 10, 15 minutes, get out there. If not, some just kind of blue and rich light will kind of help wake your brain up. Um, exercise earlier in the day, not later in the day. So, um, I, you know, don't go for a six, seven mile jog at seven or eight o'clock at night, but try to do it earlier if you can. Um, you can kind of bank sleep. So if you are um, working and you're gonna have a long day or you have a lot of these type of talks, um, you know, another disclosure, I took a 30 minute nap um, after lunch before giving this talk. I just kind of uh, closed my eyes. I say nap, it was really just kind of some deep breathing exercise. But I just kind of closed my eyes and I eventually did probably fall asleep five to 10 minutes. But you can do that, just set an alarm. And then judicious use of caffeine. Um, so my three o'clock tea right now that I've been drinking, um, just I just um, do a little bit of that. You don't want to overdo it um, too much, but just kind of know what your body can, can do. And then of course, limiting alcohol use. So um, alcohol does, it's kind of counterintuitive that people think it will help them fall asleep, but actually it um, interferes with some of the sleep centers in your brain. It can actually cause problems to get a full night's sleep. Um, keeping a um, regular sleep um, wake schedule. I think this is really difficult for those of us working more from home. My admin week, I was staying up um, past 11 most nights and I usually go to bed about 10 or 10.30 and wake up about six or 6.30. So I was still waking up at my normal time. Um, I think this is really tough for those of us with um, kids at home right now and um, what to do with while they're out of school. Um, my teenager is basically sleeping till 11 or 11.30 most days and staying up. Um, so I've kind of let her do that because she's continuing to do her work. Um, doing your nighttime routines, particularly with your family, if you can, if you're not on call. Um, so when I'm not on call at night, my phone goes on a silence or do not disturb. Um, just because there's those text message threads that I was talking about, sometimes people start sending stuff to that. Um, and then just kind of optimizing your sleep environment. Um, last thing is, um, kind of found this. I, I saw a lot of people signing on, have a background in social work. And I think many of you may be members of this, of your national organization. So the National Association of Social Workers, they actually have an entire page dedicated um, to uh, the COVID-19. If you go just to their main site, it's right there, or I've included the link as well um, that you can access. Uh, but it's one of the first things that you can link on to there. Um, and with that, I think I finished with the required 20 minutes of question time. Um, so I'll just say thank you for all, thank you all for what you're doing. Um, keep up the good work. Uh, we have to remember that this is not just a marathon, but probably going to be an ultra marathon, um, and that we can't overdo it right now during this acute process. We really must focus on and knowing how long this is going to last and um, that we're looking at um, months and if not years of kind of dealing with that um, outcomes of the COVID-19. Uh, the last few ones are just some resources as well as um, some references. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Christina? Thank you, Dr. Baxter. That was amazing. Um, I'm here to take questions. I'm going to moderate the chat. So if you all have questions for Dr. Baxter, you can go ahead and put them in the chat right now, and I'll go ahead and ask them for you. Well, um, Mike, I don't know if you can see, but a lot of people in the chat wrote how much they appreciate this presentation and that it was awesome. And really, thank you. Thank you very, very much. So besides CEU, does anyone have a question for uh, Dr. Baxter? I just wondered how do we take naps with kids that are online? <laughs> and when, when you talked about this, this is what was in my mind. <laughs> um, with kids so at home on... boring or that they need to learn from distance and they need help and... So, right, I think it's difficult, particularly, um, I know one of my colleagues has uh, four children, eight, and under um and i think yesterday had 
six different Zoom meetings for them for distance learning between daycare and the schools. So it is really difficult. Um, so I, I don't know if I can answer that exactly. I wish I could, but I think maybe just kind of finding those different times when you, the kids can be engaged for 30 minutes and you know that they're safe and ideally if you have someone else that's kind of there um, and just kind of talking to them and be like, hey, I, I'm just gonna, I need 15 or 20 minutes. Cause even that just sitting there closing your eyes with some deep breathing has been shown to help um, and um, help with that. You can just kind of sit there and let your brain reset. Um, I did see one question come up from. Can yeah, I... there are some. Yeah. Okay. So. Christina? I'll start moderating them for you, Dr. Baxter. So the first question Thank I you. see is you're welcome. Is um, working at the advocacy center, have you seen an increase in cases due to COVID 19? Um, thank you. No, we, we haven't. We actually um, have had a really significant drop off in cases. So I think in Oklahoma, this CPS referrals have decreased fairly substantially. I just was staffing with the team this morning and this past Monday was the first day that they're getting back to their normal range. I think with kids being out of school, we're seeing a, a decrease in that. Um, and there is nationally what we know is oftentimes we'll see some referrals go down during this time and then over the ensuing weeks to months go up dr dramatically and we do tend um, I think Dr. Passmore kind of talked about this yesterday see tend to see a big spike um, in um, abuse over the next um, few weeks to months and we tend to see a spike in more severe abuse as well um, I, I do expect that to start Okay, so the next question is, can the increased stress involved with COVID-19 cause sleep issues? Um, thank you, Ms. Hendricks, for that question. Um, and also, oh, I need to, I, I forgot that. Um, one of the things I sent out, and I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Hendricks, um, Ms. Hendricks um, helped develop um, a kind of a resource list. And so it's one of the documents I send out, and I owe her a big thank you for that. Um, yes, I think it can cause sleep issues. I think. Um, well, we, we know that there's kind of different phases of stress. And when we have that short-term stress that kind of helps us get us out of situation, so the flight or flight response um, is good, but it's this chronic stress and that constant levels of the kind of a, the, the cortisol that we see, and it can definitely impact your sleep. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I kind of cautioned against over usage of alcohol, um, because you'll, you'll do that and you'll think you're gonna get a good night's sleep because you're feeling tired, but then, you kind of end up waking up. But yeah, just the stress itself, I think, can definitely impact um, sleep. And I expect a lot of people to have some sleep disturbances during this time. Thank you. Um, next question. Since this is an ultra marathon, how do you see the helping professions having to change practice for long-term adjustments? <sighs> um, great question. Um, and this is something we've been talking about as program directors for trainees and our fellowship and residents. Um, so more from the medical side. Um, so my concern, what I talked about is seeing a lot of turnover or burnout happen right now um, with those helping professions. Um, so I think that there's gonna maybe, if we can look at a silver lining, see some institutions understanding that these type of, um, that this type of impact on their workers, they're gonna need additional help and maybe we'll see some new, more system-wide changes. Um, so I think of my colleagues that work in DHS, particularly um, Child Protective Services doing an investigation and their caseloads being just way too high. And maybe with this, there'll be some changes on kind of how we look at that from the Oklahoma State and maybe even um, some of the areas across the country and even the world will kind of look at how we do that a little bit different. Okay, next question. I would like to know any recommendations for agencies to support this change in service delivery and accommodate for secondary traumatic stress. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, this is kind of what I was talking to before. So my recommendations are for your institution, wh wherever you're working for from a, a larger standpoint to understand this and have plans in place. Um, so some of the things that um, I would recommend is having um, 
really good supervision of workers um, and helpers, even, you know, from my standpoint as a faculty member doing this for 10 years, still having that mentorship and being able to do um, both formal and informal debriefings. Um, um, again, kind of going back more to the larger, bigger picture of having um, caseloads more closely um, followed and, and kind of restricted, um, increasing um, uh, workers' pay, I think is going to be something that would, would help as well and, and helping um, support them through that aspect as well. So I, I agree with you. I, there's so many recommendations I could probably go on for the rest of the talk on that. But I think that um, you, we need to start again at a higher level. So looking at nationally and then here in Oklahoma, you know, kind of pushing for some of those changes. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. When you are doing your best as a leader, I'm not in your vicarious trauma. I'm just gonna wait for a second. Somebody needs to meet their mic. I think I just muted them. Oh, I muted you. Sorry. You now? It's okay. We yeah. gotta figure things out little by little. This is new to everybody. Um, when you're doing your best as a leader and not in your vicarious trauma response brain, what are you telling your team of essential workers to support them or help maintain morale? Oh. Um. I think I, I focus on the good aspects of the day. So um, just this past week, um, not to slime you all with trauma, but had a fairly um, severe case in our local ICU uh, for a child. And as I was following up with a child on, you know, I would call it basically every morning and follow up with our residents. Um, and as I called that morning, the resident kind of gave me an update, just a medical update, and at the end just kind of said, how do you do this each time? And so I kind of just shared, I think as for me, it's sharing that it's something that affects all of us and told her how it impacted me and how it, I kind of learned to process this and sharing that with her. And then pulling back to more of that compassion satisfaction and talking about this is how you can take from this case and learn and impact that next child that you see to make maybe have a more positive outcome for that child um, and to learn from it from that aspect and then just kind of I pulled out some more of the positive things that she could take from it and so that's when I feel like I'm at my best is when I'm taking something that may be really bad that they're experiencing and helping them focus on any of the positive aspects in a realistic way and then also normalizing it for them and letting them know that they're not that nothing's wrong with them for experiencing this, that it is something that we all experience and even seasoned providers uh, um, experience it as well. Okay, thank you. Next question. How can an inpatient agency help staff deal with compassion fatigue and burnout? I know what I need to do personally, but how can I present an implementation at the agency level? Great question. So, um, I'm not sure what your background is, but if it's in something where you can provide um, debriefings, um, formal debriefings for um, those people on the front lines and patients seeing these, um, even um, not just for the medical providers, but for the cleaning staff and for um, all these other people doing such important work and arranging for them to kind of come in and utilize your expertise to um, address some of these secondary trauma um, symptoms that they may be experiencing in the compassion fatigue. I think that would be huge right now, just kind of implementing that without adding to their caseload more or, or, or their, their work more, but just kind of being there and being utilizing your expertise to kind of um, do some either formal debriefings where you sit down and actually have a plan thing or uh, being available for informal debriefings where they can kind of just bounce some things off of you. Um, and then also, I think addressing with them that this is um, some of the, the, you know, normalizing it for them, saying that everyone may be experiencing this. And then um, I did send those handouts, which I think would be helpful that you can kind of look through and maybe you can even provide those handouts um, from the, um, um, they kind of go through and talk about how healthcare providers and what they can do um, on that. Thank you. Okay, we have two more mm -hmm. questions. Um, what do you think the number of positive results are rising in Tulsa and the state? 
Do you believe that the lack of true, do you believe that there's lack of true social distancing in Tulsa is working? Um, so when we look at our overall curve, Oklahoma's actually doing okay. We were, um, we haven't hit our projected surge yet, which is, I believe, scheduled for the 27th still by all models. Um, but about two weeks ago, our doubling rate was um, every 2.3 days. And now I think our doubling rate is um, quite a bit higher than that, um, meaning that our cases are not doubling every two and a half days like they were. So I think we did have a hundred and so cases added, um, 10 or so deaths in the past 24 hours, but that has slowed. Um, so that I, I do think is reassuring and our overall curve is leveling off for across Oklahoma. Is to your question, do I believe social distance in Tulsa is working? Um, as I was driving here to do this talk and I looked over at the Walgreens and there was about 40 people walking in there, um, I think we could be doing a better job. Um, I think that it is working, but I think it could work even better if we had um, a little bit more um, true social distancing. Um, Tulsa actually did a fairly good job of implementing this early. Oklahoma City followed behind a little bit. Um, my concern is a statewide, particularly that we have so many rural areas that maybe drive into the metropolitan areas, um, maybe impacting some of that. Thank you. Uh, ancestral trauma being already prevalent issue here in Oklahoma, especially, how do you feel we as a state could do better to ensure that people have the support they need in the next few years or decade after this has calmed down? Um, thank you. I love that question. And this has been something that's really been on my mind. Um, I will just be fully honest. I, I moved to Oklahoma in the late 80s. Um, and I did not know all the trauma that this state um, has caused others, or people in the state have caused others and people have experienced. Um, and I'm, it's just now really something that I'm starting to learn about. Um, it is something that for me, I think we need to address um, absolutely. Um, looking at if it's from the uh, Tulsa Race Massacre, from what we're coming on our 100 year anniversary to um, what's happened to sort of so many of our um, uh, uh, native um, tribes and everything like that is definitely something that needs to be addressed. Um, I, I am not an expert on how to fix all of that, um, other than I think that um, there needs to be real um, progressive legislation um, with funding written for these, um, for, for what has happened to provide support for them on multiple levels. Um, yeah, that, that's something I, I really do appreciate that question. I wish I could answer it better, but I think that there's probably better experts out there on it than me, but um, something I'm definitely trying to pay attention to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How to help home visitors and teachers deal with the fact that they are no longer able to lay eyes on students and families? And um, um, Mike, this is going to be our last uh, question. And yes, then, Christina, you will be able to say a few words about uh, the CEUs. Um, so there was actually um, the IPSCAN did um, talking a little bit about this last week that I listened to. Um, I think that it is difficult for the teachers. Um, I think this is something that they get their some of their compassion and satisfaction probably from those seeing their smiles and hearing the kids at school. Um, although I'm sure that some of their um, stress comes from that as well. Um, so for me, this is a stress because I know again what Dr. Passmore talked about yesterday. For those of you who had listened to that, um, that a lot of our kids when they um, have experienced maltreatment are able to talk to someone at school and um, help keep them safe from then. Um, so I don't know if there's anything I know in the evidence base to specifically help with them other than if they can find a way to interact with them either through online um, and developing that rapport there I think is, is important. Hopefully they already have rapport with them and um, just being able to have that kind of relationship continue. But um, to be honest, I don't know if there's any specific thing that I could pinpoint that's going to be an answer right now. Um, I think it's something that we're probably going to discover over the next few months of um, kind of getting feedback on what's worked and hasn't. Um, 